Black fatherhood. Cause we know, we know we need black fathers in our community. We all know that. Um, first of all, thank the um, the uh, organizers of this event. Our good brother, uh, Baba Baruti, Baba Omar told me, he instructed me, he said, yo, I want you to make a speech and I want you to do a poem. So I gotta do two things today, so I'm gonna try to make it not too long, but uh, we're gonna try to do it. But uh, So why are we here? We're here to talk about black fatherhood. We're here to talk about the importance of having a black man in the household. Now we all know what happens when black men are not in the household. We know that. We've seen the statistics. We've heard all, the, all of the analysts. We don't need to even see the statistics. All we got to do is look out into the street and we can see what's going on. We see the self-destruction. And I know it gets hard. It gets hard when you see all of the things that happen and we say, Lord, what's wrong with our people? What's wrong with black folks? I mean, we just killing each other. We fighting and killing and all of this type of thing. But we got to make sure that we put things in its proper perspective. You know what I'm saying? We, can't make sure, we gotta make sure we believe the hype because if we put things in this proper perspective, what happens in our community is something that can be predicted. It's something that should be expected. Because when you take into account that for over 500 years we've been in a system that has told us that we are less than human beings, even in their constitution they have defined us for voting purposes as being three-fifths of a human being. But yet, you combine that with the fact of over 100 years of lynching, murders, and raping in which nobody has ever paid for. But if you combine that with the years and decades of gentrification and redlining, pushing our people into communities that lack the very resources needed for survival, and you combine that with the flood of our communities with crack cocaine and you can bind that with laws manipulated to lead to the explosion of mass incarceration and you combine that with the school to prison pipeline and you can buy y'all get the picture y'all y'all get the picture y'all hear that y'all feel where i'm coming from now see we can talk about this all day we can go on and on and on you know what i'm saying dr uh umar johnson will be back at the breakfast club we'll still be talking about the ways that america has attacked us so we know that so the things that go in on in our community the type of self-destructive behavior is not something that should be surprising. It's not something that should not be expected. What is unexpected is the fact that despite being attacked on an over 500 year genocidal program, we are still here. We are still standing strong and we are still surviving. Look at how beautiful you are. Just look at how beautiful you are. And we keep on growing. And, and like I said, I'm going to make it quick. I'm going to do this poem in a, in a second. But um, we talk about the problem all day. And the way I see it, anytime you have a people who are in a situation, a condition, where our economic system, our political system, our social systems, our justice systems, our educational systems, all of the systems that govern our lives are in control by the same individuals who have historically benefited from our exploitation. Anytime that reality exists, it's gonna be real hard for us to solve our problems collectively. Since we know the problem, since we understand the problem, then let's not focus on the problem, let's focus on the solution. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because see, right now, we have the power, we have the ability to create institutions within our own community that we control and that benefits us. We can do that. We can create our own school. We ain't gotta keep on complaining about, man, these schools are failing us. Well, we need to create schools in which we can control. We can do that. You know what I'm saying? Just uh, instead of uh, buying the Michael Jordans, let, 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 let's put away something for our own schools. You know what I'm saying? Instead of talking about how bad the food is and how it's killing us, and it is killing us. You know what I'm saying? We can get some of this land and we can grow our own foods. We can create our own grocery stores. We can do for self. You know what I'm saying? At some point in time, we gotta grow up. And you stop saying, I'm a minority. Minority means you a minor. That means you a baby, you're not an adult. But globally, we ain't minorities. We outnumber other people who have been dominating us over 10 to one. So we need to act like it. Be grown men and women and take responsibility for our community. Because we can do that. Because you come from the greatest people on this planet. We have been through hell and back and we are still here. So don't tell me what we can't do. 
but we got to unite. We got to get together. We need in Memphis, Tennessee, a united front. Thank you. And what I mean by united front, all the organizations, all the individuals who are serious. And when I say serious, I mean serious. They ain't got time to be playing because it's too serious. But if you're serious about getting together and doing something for your community, then we need all of us working together. Because right now, we got individuals over here kind of doing their thing, individuals over here doing their thing, over, over here doing their thing, and we ain't working together. But see, the thing is, is if I take this one finger, it's not very powerful. I might poke you. If I get lucky, I might poke you in the eye. But that's only if I'm lucky. But if I take five fingers, ball them up in the fist, and put all my power behind it and focus hit you right there at that sweet spot on the chin, it will knock your tail out. You know what I'm saying? So that's what I'm about. I'm about nation building. I'm part of something called the Republic of New Africa. I just left an uh, organiza uh, organizational meeting of something called Nation Day, and it was spectacular, y'all. We got people up there in, in, in America, black people, just creating our own businesses, just creating our own schools, and creating uh, institutions that are building for our people. This is happening. You ain't going to see it on CNN. You ain't gonna see it on CNN, so you gotta get into the loop. So if y'all serious, are you part of an organization, or are you just part of, you just an individual who wanna help? Holler at me. We got people around who doing the same thing that's in the audience. Holler at us, and we'll make this thing happen. It's already going on. This is something, you know, this ain't something I'm just saying at the spare of the moment. This is the continuation of something going on. Cause I'm serious about that. I'm serious about black unity and us getting together. But uh, like I said, I gotta keep my word. I gotta do a poem before I get out of here. Uh, matter of fact, this is about Disunity. It's called disconnected. Get in my zone. See? Some, <clears throat> sometimes I feel like my landline telephone at home forever disconnected. I mean, our unity's been neglected, our humanity disrespected simply because I might have selected the wrong group, the wrong crew, the wrong club, the wrong clique, the wrong organization to hang with. Now that's some lame sh and I admit that I might have even been born into the wrong religion. But due to that wrong decision, our division's been carved out with surgical light precision, bringing about a collision between who would otherwise be brothers. But although brothers from a different mother, artificial man-made barriers have taught us that we should hate each other. Because you see, see, I, I'm a G and, and, and you a VL and we dwell on opposite sides of the street separated by alphabets, although sometimes the alphabets may be Greek from alpha to omega, kappa, phi, beta, sigma, gamma, rho, the delta, sigma, theta, that girl I don't even know, but all I know is that I hate her. Man. See, see, I'm dark skinned, you light skinned, we fussing and fighting, dividing and conquering for over 400 years by some white man and I find...
now it's just the you was about the me, and I'm waiting for that day that I can again see that time when we're actually home when I call the seals. I just keep getting that dial tone. I even work. That lady is telling me that the person you trying to reach. So long as it's served, please hang up. Try your call again. Seal disconnected. She lay y'all be. <laughs> There. Wave your hand, Mr. Tri-State Defender. A John Koo, maybe he. Wave your hand, sir. Yes, sir. I'm talking about that guy right there. So if you, uh, if you got, uh, again, if you are a um, entrepreneur and you want to advertise your business or your service, you need to get at him. Put some ads in the paper because he who holds the purse holds the power. And if all he getting advertising from is from uh, institutions outside of our community, well, they ain't that interested in reading about our community. Huh? So I'm suggesting that we support the new Tri-State Defender or any other publication uh, of, of a black origin. Sometimes they say a black radio station. No, it's just black folk reading white folk news. And again, in no way, I guess, uh, Dr. Umar, uh, I interviewed him today, and we said that anytime you try to unite black people, you have to, no other race has to do this, but we have to preference the fact that to love black, you don't have to hate white. To love black, you have to have no discord. You can have no discord with Hispanics or Native Americans or whoever it is. That's just the way it is. All the Lakers, guess what? I know this is a surprise, but all the Lakers play for the Lakers. Huh? All the Steelers, what? Play for the Steelers, don't they? Until they trade it. All the Cowboys play for the Cowboys until they trade it. So why all the blacks don't play for the blacks? Okay, so that is my analogy for you today. Hold on to that thought, and we're going to figure it out, though. Again, today we're not blaming the victim. There is no negativity here today. We're not coming to say what we ain't do, what we can't do, and why can't we now, none of that. Today we're going to figure out how we're going to do it and why we're going to do it. Right now, he's coming to the stage right now, and I'm talking about Brother Gore. Where are you, Brother Gore? Come on up, man. Listen, melanin is a thing. That's phenomelanin, uh, planetary melanin, uh, 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 cosmic melanin, and this brother, dark as he is, he got all of them. He blocking in the hundred midnights down in the cypress swamp. And while some may think that is a negative thing, that is a check, man, I wish I had that kind of melanin because y'all don't even understand the power of that particular chemical. But I'm going to let that go. Put your hands together as he comes in his own way. Show him some love, y'all. How are we doing this wonderful, is it Monday? How are we doing this Monday? How are we doing? Well, I come to you uh, from Jackson, Tennessee. I hail originally from Indianapolis, Indiana, and I, I come just to say a little something to you on today. I've been involved in athletics my entire life, so I'm all about motivation. I'm all about picking folks up. I'm all about making people feel like they can climb a mountain. I don't know if anybody's ready to climb a mountain today, but we got a mountain in front of us. And I don't know if you paid attention, but we hear for the Million Fathers March because we have a mountain in front of us. I don't know if anybody's looked out there and seen the young carnage that's in our streets. I don't know if we're blind or we just refuse to see. But we have to find a way within ourselves to combat this issue. See, we can keep going and asking the government to find a way to right legislation what legislation is going to fix despair what legislation is going to fix economic despair what legislation is going to fix poverty they've been doing it now for 300 years and we're still impoverished what legislation is going to fix education they had new bills they create new agendas, but our children still don't read at grade level. So what do we need? We need some motivation. See, I looked into the Bible one day and I saw that Lazarus was asleep. And while Lazarus was asleep, his sisters called for Jesus. And when Jesus got there, you know, they said Jesus wept. And you know, our community is still weeping. You know, we've been through slavery. We've been through Jim Crow. 
We've been through red line. We've been through hangings, tars, and featherings. And we continue to weep. And we continue to sleep. Because we didn't understand how to fight. So we come today to put in order what it takes to fight. It takes some economic power. It takes unity and desire to achieve. It takes the understanding that we are greater in number than we are alone. It takes that ingenuity that you know, young man, and I don't know if you understand this, but I play golf. I got you, brother. And I understand that a long time ago there was a brother who was a caddy that they wouldn't let him play at the golf course. But because somehow he liked the other side so much, he decided to create a golf tee so they could put the ball in the air and hit it a little further. Now, I don't understand why the golf tee was invented by a black man for a white man's sport at the time. Why he didn't take that to his own club and bring that to his own people and then sell it to the other folks. See, we got to learn how to start selling what we do. We are an intelligent and bright and, and a very creative group of people. This melanin that I have and the melanin that you have gives us more power than you'd ever understand. If you understood how much you've been experimented on by other races to find out why this melanin gives you your strength. If you understood why the diet that we eat and why they put the fools in our neighborhoods, if you understood why they do that is to demasculate our males. Yeah, they, yeah, they demasculating us. They emasculating the male population of Afro-Americans every day. And we sit idle by and continue to weep. I can test to you today as my minute is up. We got to stop weeping. We got to stop looking for somebody to solve these issues. We have to bring our families back together. We got to bring the men and women of our community back together. We got to end the despair and bring about some hope. Because right now, if you look in our streets, it's hopelessness, it's fear, it's confusion, and we have the answer. If we can come up with a golf tee, if we can come up with the GPS, if we can come up with the cell phone, if we can come up with how to steam engine and how to make a great ship, we as a people right now today can begin to mend our families. Give the men in our families their masculinity back. Give the men in our families the right to raise their children and bring us back to where we once were, a proud, striving, strong nation that survived our own Holocaust. Amen? Amen. Amen. So let it be written, so let it be done. That's what's up. All right, y'all. Listen, I, um, oh, we also invented the hookup. Y'all, you know the little known fact? Girl went to McDonald's, and, uh, and she didn't have no money. And she it was a friend of the one, and she said, girl, hook me up. That was in 1963 at McDonald's on Third Street. All right, that's what's up. All right, so listen, y'all. Uh, what am I supposed to be doing? I'm supposed to be telling y'all something. Oh, first of all, this young lady got a talk show, Yams Talk Show. And I'm and we going and of course they out there on the show right there. Is that your show? Or they doing something else over there. They doing something else. All right, all right. Oh, this is what we gonna do. We got spotters. We got cash prizes to give away. Anybody want to win some cash? Woo wee! If I need some gas right now, anybody call on E. Raise your hand, E. If you're on E, come on, we're playing. All right, the way you gonna win the cash? We got a one dance minimum. Y'all didn't know that about this here uh, march and everything. And I had talked to the Lord, and he said it was okay. Well, can y'all come around here inside the speakers? Y'all too far. Can y'all come inside the speakers? Yeah, hey, I got him, Gary. I already know you out there. I already know you out there. Tighten up. Brother Omar, can you come around the front, Brother Omar? 
Yes, sir. Come on, ladies, make some noise. Act like y'all. Act like these brothers. Boys to men. Somebody up in here. Woo -wee. Some of y'all trying to hide. Don't be trying to hide, man. It's time to show up. Show out, brothers. Uh, Van Turner. Come on, Van. Come on over here, man. Where you at, Van? We need elected officials, Mona Bees, anybody. We need everybody. Fellas, what y'all doing way out there, man? Come on, man. Come on, man. Come on, man. My guy eating your uh your freeze pop right here. Yes, yeah, sir. What you doing? Come on, man. Come on. You ain't no daddy. That's how you a man. This is it's, it's about a, a man thing. My guy in the, in the burgundy shirt. I want to say to all the fathers, man, who may not be with your family every day, your family still needs you, man. Your daughters need you. Your daughters need a hug from you. They need to know you love them. They need to get love in the right places before they try to find them in the wrong places. And it's not hard at all, man. Even if that lady is a fool. I ain't scared of y'all. You owe it to that girl, man. You owe it to your son to get in there. Fellas, come on around. Y'all come around this side over here, man. You all come around on this side. We, we have it on that side. We need to come on this side over here, y'all. Yes, sir. Come on stage. Just some of y'all come on stage if y'all want it. Don't you? This all good? Yeah, yeah. All right, all the guys outside the speaker, everybody outside the speaker, come on stage, man. Y'all might can sing A through D select. If you don't want to come on stage, fellas, just, just scoot your way. Just scoot your way on in, man. You got to get on stage. That's all right. Come on, if you don't mind, but come on. I know, but you know, you know, you know how we get it, fellas. All right, there you go. There you go. Be the change you seek. All right, it's all good. Hey, fellas, and then, and then listen, man, sometimes it's okay to not know all the answers. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's okay to say, I don't know. That's a good thing. All right, let's look at who, who got us. Who, who for the takers? Gary, you got us? You gonna count us down? All right, let Mr. Turner come on in here. Yeah. Inside the speakers, inside the speakers fellas. Y'all scoot on in. Act like y'all like each other. Now I say, yeah, I say, yeah, y'all can stand up if y'all want. I just got down. I say sometimes, you know, unity will come, but first we need the same idea, huh? Cause I could be cussing you out while we go to Miss Johnson uh, store to buy some soap, huh? And then she gonna hide my daughter and your son and then when they have a little program, I'm going to find out you're not as crazy as I thought you would. And then we're going to have unity. You ready? All right, uh, fellas, stick your chest out, man. Make your chest more chest of it. Some of y'all. All right, here we go. On three. One, two, three. All right. Hold on a second. We're going to take another one. We're going to take another one. This time we're just going to do, we're well, not a fish yet. We're going to do fish at the end. This time just do some type of expression with your hands. And don't cover up another brother. One, two, three, express. All right, now this last one, we can put some fists up, fellas. Let's get some fists up right here. Power. That Pastor Ricky Floyd, I see him over there. Black power. A million Black Fathers March. Man, this is a beautiful thing right here. Y'all hear me? Ladies, can y'all give us a hand that we deserve? I know a welfare hand. Give us a real hand. Black hand for the man. You hear me? That's sir. Uh, yes, hey, sir, right here. Sir, 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 right here. Sir, right here. Y'all keep going. Y'all good, fellas. Thank y'all so very much. Sir, yeah, I'm trying to get you to say something. Say hello to the people. Uh, hello. Hello. Oh. Now that he is safely dead, let us praise him. For dead men make convenient heroes. They cannot rise up and challenge the image. Now that he is safely dead, it's easy to build a monument rather than a movement. It's all right to say that I'm a man. My father was one of those sanitation workers. But it's now time to be the man. Be the man that create a new FedEx. Be the man that build a, a new hospital. Be the man that build a new community. I'm a man to be the man. We have been running too long in fear. We have been walking too long in doubt. We have been crawling too long in self-pity. It is now time for us to move and to fly to greatness. I have a dream this afternoon. Uh -oh. I feel like Martin Luther up in here, boy. Hey! Listen here. Uh, we talking about buying back the block. How many of y'all don't even know y'all neighbor? You move in at night, you get a TV, you put it in at night, you cut the box up and you hide it. I ain't saying you're wrong. I'm just simply saying we need to change that. Amen? All right, say less. These brothers coming up real quick. They're going to get two minutes. They're going to talk to us about real estate and how we can begin to buy back the block. Show some love as we celebrate the Million Fathers March.
How you doing, everybody? They call me Mr. Land Man. I travel the country and I help African Americans how to own land in America. So I'm in Memphis, and it's Dream Big Memphis, but also the One Million Man March, the One Father's March, it all connects together for me because I try to make one million landmark. That's the thing. I want you to own land in America. I want you to understand that land is the only way that we can create wealth. So as I'm traveling the country, I teach and motivate African Americans and Americans alone to own land. Right now in Memphis, April 11th, I want you to get your phones out. This is very important. CivicSource.com. Go to CivicSource.com and on April 11th, you can bid on land in Frazier, South Memphis, North Memphis, Orange Mound. Bidding start at $25 to own lots of land in Memphis starting on April 11th. I'm fighting for the culture to own land, period. So go to CivicSource.com. Get your phones out. I don't see nobody's phones. You must want to own no land. Go to CivicSource.com. Register as a bidder. And when you register bidder, you click accept. Do not put your banking information in the system until April 10th at 9.01 a.m. And then on April 11th at 9.01, you can start bidding on land in Memphis and owning lots of land in your own community to change the concept and mindset of America. That's what we want to do. So my job is to train and educate land ownership. Anthony Johnson is the first black landowner in America. I teach this history around America. Anthony Johnson was born 1663. He owned white slaves and black slaves. He owned over 125 acres of land. This was the first black man in America on deed to own land in America. So how come as African American we don't own land? We have to change the mindset. The culture has to change. John Malone is a Caucasian gentleman. He's white, but he owns two million acres of land. Amazon, Jeff, he owns he owns 420,000 420, acres of land. Ted Turner, who owns TBS, he owns he owns 1.2 million acres of land. There's a guy named Stan. Stan is my friend. Let me tell you why Stan. Stan owns the Seattle Supersonics. He owns Seattle Seahawks. He owns land. I want you to change your mindset. My name is Mr. Landman. I'm buying back USA on Instagram, and I want you to change your mindset in America. Own some land in America. Thank you so much. We're about to bring him back. He's sure saying something. Come on, sir. Yes, sir. You got your two minutes. Come on. I actually don't need two minutes. Okay. Uh, I'm here representing the New Black Panther Party here in Memphis, Tennessee. We're heavily recruiting right now. Um, I like to appreciate publicly uh, the Million Fathers March. Fathers are very important. Brothers, we need to go back home. We got to take care of our families and children. If anybody's interested in joining the New Black Panther Party, as I said before, we heavily recruit. We back at the table over there. I appreciate y'all. Black, Black power. Black power. We don't have it unless you win it too. That's what's up. That's what's up. Hey y'all, black is not a dirty word. Black is not a dirty word. Y'all hear me? All right, if you want to be African American, where you want to be? You still have color, and the color is black. It's brown or something. I don't know what to tell you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, he's coming right now. We're minutes away, so we want to have the stage wide open so when Dr. Umar Johnson comes, we put him right up on the stage, and then we all can go home and watch the national championship tonight. I mean, do whatever we're going to do tonight and everything. Put your hands together right now for Mr. Van Turner, representing the NAACP. All right. How's everyone doing? It's good to be here with y'all. I'm waiting to hear Dr. Umar Johnson like we all are. But just on behalf of the NACP, I want to let y'all know that we stand with you. Whether it was fighting for Mason, Tennessee, but the legislature was coming down to take Mason's charter away, we had to sue to fight for Mason, Tennessee. Whether it was being vocal and standing up for the family of Tyree Nichols, and we're all dealing with that now, but we can't let that end we can't let that incident end on a cold pavement in Hickory Hill. We have to fight for the Tyree Nichols Police Reform Act. That's how we make sure Mr. Nichols' death was not in vain. We need true reform. A lot of our soldiers have left us. We've lost Mother King. We've lost Minister Yahweh. So now it's time for new leadership to take their place. It's time for new leadership 
to move this issue forward, move the issues of black people. And we can't be afraid as elected officials to say we are black and we support black causes and we support black people. I do. We all should. We can't be ashamed to represent who and what we are. Yes, sir. If I'm able to get to where I'm trying to get to, understand that you will have somebody that loves black people and they will fight for black people day in and day out down in City Hall. I thank y'all for allowing me to take this opportunity to speak with y'all. We stand united, we stand with you, and we're gonna make sure that our causes are heard and that our causes are taken seriously and that we will win. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm Van Ford and I approve this message. co-host of 901 Voices and Votes. You can find us online at 1-1800-MEDIA. We come on every Monday. We download new shows every Monday. We're interviewing elected officials for this upcoming season. This is a very pivotal and important election this year. I am also a candidate for Shelby County, Memphis, and Shelby County because that's how I look at it and I'm not promoting consolidation, but we do need to come together and work together. But that is Memphis City Council District 3. That seat is currently held by Patrice Robinson who's rolling off due to term limits. And I wanna say two things quickly. We gotta keep the money in our community. What would it look like if you took all the groceries from your house and put them in my house? What would it look like if you siphoned the gas out of your car and put it in our car? Our money is leaving our community. Our money is leaving our community every day. We are rich, but we make ourselves poor every day when we spend money away from ourselves. And it doesn't make any sense to do that. Part of my platform, I'm gonna be working with entities from a community level like the Chamber of Commerce and other entities to increase and stabilize the black middle class in Memphis because that's what we need. And also creating more black wealth. Thank you for this opportunity once again, Pearl Walker, Memphis City Council District 3. Thank you all for having this event and I love all black fathers. That's what's up, that's what's up. See, I wasn't gonna let no girls say that. You know Omar Baruti. Uh, I am the CEO and founder of Parenting with a Purpose. The reason that we came into existence is because as going into the prison, helping inmates set up companies so that when they get out, they can form a company and they don't have to ask for a job. They can make a job. But I kept seeing younger and younger inmates in the prison. And I'm trying to figure out how you get in here. And as I'm talking to them, I'm realizing that there's a fracture in the family. Most of the time, the father's not there. So my wife and I decided, let's go do foster care because a lot of the ones we talked to came from the foster care system. And the first child we got was 12 years old with 34 felonies. Five of them were grand theft auto. And I asked the child, how do you bring a stolen cop to your mother's house? And what did she say? She just wanted to know if I had enough gas to take her to the store. <clears throat> I said, wait a minute, she work at the store? No, she's a booster. I know what a booster was, break it down to me, I don't know what that is. And when he told me that she'd go and shoplift and sell stuff on the corner, and then she's praising him for stealing. The same child at 12 years old is now in prison at 26 years old. With 32 foster children, I kept seeing the same pattern. Either broken parenting, ineffective parenting, or no parenting at all. And I realized that the only way I can really step my foot in the, in the fire and save the children is I've got to set up a way to get the parents back on track. I got eight children. All of them got a degree in something. <laughs> from, the doc, from the bachelor to the master to the PhD because my daddy raised me and he wouldn't let us get on track. And I decided I'm going to raise you like I, my daddy raised me. 
And back, just think about this. Back in the day, you're not an elder, but think back in the day. The community raised you. You didn't disrespect no elders. You didn't bring nothing stolen to your mama's, daddy's house. And if you got in trouble at school, you got in some more trouble when you got where? Got home. That's how we raised the children. The whole village, the whole community stepped in and put a hand in the pot. Nowadays, now you can't even raise your voice. And nowadays, children don't even respect elders. So I decided, let's go back and let's figure out a way to solve the problem. And then I realized the biggest piece of this puzzle was the absence of the black man from the home. If a boy had a real image of a man, he wouldn't be looking at gangster rapper. There ain't no, there ain't no man. There ain't no, you know, you go call a, a woman a bitch in a hoe. That ain't no man. You don't disrespect your woman. That's your queen. That's what a black man has to do. Come back home and take charge of your family and teach your children how to go in the right direction. A girl don't know what a real man looks like or she's dealing with a gangster rapper. That ain't no man. And then she ends up pregnant. And then, think about this. 32 children, most of the birth certificates said father unknown. You don't know you had who you had your baby with? Come on. That's why on our radio show, we have something called the Love Power Show. On our radio show, we deal with family issues in the black community. We got to solve them ourselves because the system that caused the problem is not going to solve the problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Family, fathers, brothers, uncles, men are the most important people in the world. The most important. And Dr. Omar and I, every Sunday on WMQM, 1600 on your dial AM, we talk about this. Yes. We, don't, we don't hold back now. Be ready for shock. Because as men, we have to talk to our community as men. We can't talk to our community as wimps and afraid of what we are saying or how somebody going to take what we are saying. Are we complying with the norms? Are we standing politically correct? Hell no. Let me put it straight to you. Hell no. We're going to tell you exactly as it is. Join us every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock and listen to men and women. And when the women call in, they have the same attitude that we have. Yes, yes, yes. It just lets you know how far away those other people are from telling the truth. We tell the truth, period. Listen to the show. Dr. Omar Baruti and Tulu Alameen. We do it right. And it's called Love Power. The Love Power Show. And besides that, I have my own radio station. Kicking it. Satellite radio station. An internet brand. And we play R&B, pardon me, R&B, blues, and classic on Friday night. Because we want to bring you back to your roots. That's kicking it, K-I-C-K-Y-N, Radio, R-A-D-I-O dot com. Thank you. Uh, I got with me the most famous third grader in the state of Tennessee right here who was fighting the third grade retention law up in Nashville, Tennessee. So this is my grandson, Deshaun Oliver. And we just came from Nashville. Thank you very much. Yes and gentlemen, my name is Damon Curry Morris. I am running for City Council Super District 8, Position 3. Remember my name on the ballot. This one is for the people. Listen, again, for those who are just getting here, you are a part of the One Million Fathers March. 
and tomorrow commemorates the death of Dr. Martin Luther King. But tonight, it was a fateful night just like tonight when all of Memphis was gathered in Mason Temple. I think that's where it was. And uh, to hear the final speech of Dr. Martin Luther King. Well, we couldn't bring back Dr. King, of course, but we got another outside agitator. We got another who has spent years diagnosing our children in the school systems. He has spent years studying and learning and, and, and garnering knowledge and finding out the, the truths that are behind the truths. Today, you may not agree with everything this brother has to say. You may not even believe everything this brother has to say. But what you do have to do is respect what this brother has to say, and I hope that something resonates with you that will make you want to be different when you leave here than you were when you got here. Today, fellas, I encourage you, man, to know that uh, it's all right not to have all the answers, but to just to know what you know and to know what you know. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, grab a seat. Take your shoes off. Grab your purse. And let's get ready for this brother that's about to come in just a matter of moments. Come on as close as you can. Come on around. We're just going to be a family. Whether you're black, whether you're white, it doesn't matter. Today, you're going to hear truth. And truth don't care where it come from. And truth don't care who it hit. So if you're going to go FaceTime live or if you're just going to take some, some videos, I'm encouraging you to not let it keep you from being focused on the moment. Sometimes the folk ain't here, they ain't supposed to be here. I ain't scared of y'all. But while you try to provide, be, be a cameraman, go down channel three, channel five, get a job. Because today we need to be in this moment. Today we need to have our focus on what we're focusing on. If you want to FaceTime it or whatever, you that's fine. I'm just talking. But I'm encouraging you to be in the moment. Can we do that? Yeah. All right, all right, that's what's up. And again, I am Michael Andrew Davis, 88.5. I bought the old Casey's Motel on Elvis Presley's Boulevard. Uh, the first, in phase one, I'm doing a food truck. So if you, a food truck park. So if you have a food truck, holla at me. We're going to get you on there because some of y'all food truck parked in the driveway all week. Ain't made a quarter. You can be out there, I own the land. We ain't even talking about no money. We just talking about commerce. We talking about black people coming together to spend money with each other. Y'all hear me? Yeah. All right, all right, so it ain't about no money. I, I own it. I ain't got no notes or nothing. I just got to pay some taxes. But other than that, we're going to make that happen. I ain't scared of that either. Today, I'm encouraging you guys, whatever you got going on, let somebody know about it. Let me know about it, because we're going to tell the world on 88.5. Ladies and gentlemen, he's real. He's live. He's here. Coming to the stage. Coming to the stage. The one and only. Oh, he's got something to say. And now he's got somebody to say it to. Put your hands together for the internationally known Dr. Umar Johnson. Live in Memphis, Tennessee. Memphis, Tennessee. Make some black power noise, family. This is Memphis right here. I know how Memphis get down. One love, one love, one love. Brothers and sisters, it's an honor to be back in Memphis. This is probably my fourth or fifth visit to your city. There's so much history here. And being a history buff myself, I always cheat myself when I come to Memphis, but not staying as long as necessary. Two of my favorite places in the world are right here. One of them is about two blocks away. And it's a historical marker where Queen Mother Ida B. Wells' free press newspaper once stood. Although she was from Bowling Springs, Mississippi, she made her name here in Memphis. And one day while Queen Mother Ida B. Wells was away on business in New York, some degenerate white racist burned her newspaper office to the ground. And while she was up in New York visiting one of our greatest black journalists, an ancestor by the name of T. Thomas Fortune, who once edited the Honorable Marcus Garvey's Negro World newspaper. While meeting with that great ancestor, Queen Mother Ida B. Wells was told that she could not come back to Memphis. He said, your newspaper office has just been reduced to ashes. And there are white racists all over the state of Tennessee waiting for you at the railroad stations. They have promised to lynch you at the first sign of you being back in Memphis. 
So the queen mother would not come back to Memphis for more than 20 years because of that threat on her life. Queen mother Ida B. Wells would have went down in history as the greatest black leader of that time had Frederick Douglass not still been amongst us. No other black woman in American history has come so close to being the preeminent leader of our race except Queen Mother Ida B. Wells. So whenever I come to Memphis, I always go over there to where her office once stood because that was one brave, one bold, one unapologetically African black woman. And she had the spirit that we need to have today. I mean, think about it now. There were no rights to protect African life. And this black woman who lost both of her parents early in life assumed the responsibility of raising her siblings. One of her siblings was developmentally deficient. And while taking care of her siblings, she managed to pass the test to become a teacher in Memphis, Tennessee schools and became one of the best teachers we've ever had in Memphis. And then she heard about the lynching of a black man that she knew. And this black woman, no more than about five foot two, no more than about 140 pounds soaking wet, decided without no security behind her to report and investigate and expose every lynching she heard of. Not just in Tennessee, but she went to Alabama, she went to Mississippi, she went all over the South investigating and reporting on the lynchings of black men. And she was so bold to record the names of the people responsible for the lynchings. Queen Mother Ida B. Wells, there will only be one of her. And we may never ever see the likes of that type of black warrior feminine energy again unless we make them. And when I say make them, I want to be very clear that the black community of Tennessee, from Knoxville to Nashville, from Chattanooga to Memphis, if we don't assume the responsibility of educating our own children, there will be no future for black children in the United States. We have to be honest, Memphis, here today. On this day, where we commemorate the last black leader to give us a serious, comprehensive program of racial progress, I'm talking about the good Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And around this time, today, 55 years ago, he stumbled into the Mason Temple here in Memphis. Dr. King wasn't scheduled to speak that night, but due to the overflow of love and support, black Memphis came out in the rain and said, we ready for change now. Black Memphis came out in the rain and they said, we're ready to redo the Sanitation Workers March right now. Black Memphis came out in the rain and they made up their mind that they were no longer going to be second-class citizens. And so when Dr. King showed up, he didn't know, or maybe he did know, that it would be the last speech he ever gave. And we know the story. The next day, he walked out onto the balcony. Dr. King was never supposed to walk out onto that balcony. J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI had planned for Dr. King to be shot in the passenger seat as he drove to his evening dinner. But because he walked out onto the balcony, the assassin, who was a white Memphis Police Department officer, couldn't resist the opportunity to take the kill shot. And across the way, where you've been lied to and told James Earl Ray was sitting in hiding, it wasn't James Earl Ray who was across the street, it was the Green Berets of the U.S. Army that were across the street. 
They were the backup killers for Dr. King. And logistical support for the Dr. King assassination was provided by the Tennessee Ku Klux Klan, the Memphis Police Department, and the Memphis Fire Department. I bring that up to say that Dr. King, a man of peace, because he wanted black people to experience a justice so long denied by the politicians of this country, he had to die. Malcolm had to die. Mega Evers had to die. Fred Hampton had to die. George and Jonathan Jackson had to die, not because they had a dream to oppress anyone, but in the United States of America, a country boiling with the hypocrisy of racism, wanting to be equal is a crime. Wanting to be free is a crime. Wanting due process of law is a crime. So as we stand here tonight, we're not just here to memorialize Dr. King, although that's a big piece of it. We're not just here to memorialize Ida B. Wells, but that's a big piece of it. The question we gotta ask ourselves, a very serious question that I don't think black people think on enough, and I don't think we really ponder enough. And that question I ask you tonight, Black Memphis, do you really want to be free? Because we talk about freedom, but I don't really see us doing the things that are necessary to achieve freedom. From a psychological standpoint, what I feel is that so many of us don't want a political freedom or an economic freedom or a cultural freedom. What we want is the freedom to enjoy white people's society. I believe that when we protest, I believe that when we rebel, I believe that when we march, I believe that when we vote, I don't think we do it because we want to be free. I think we do it because we want a better existence under white supremacy. If I'm wrong, why do educated black men marry outside the community more than the men of every other race put together? If I'm wrong, why do educated black men and women run to the suburbs the minute they get a halfway decent paying job? If I'm wrong, why do we stick black children in white private schools instead of building for them their own schools? If I'm wrong, why is there not a single city in America, black city, that boasts a black Wall Street? We are 50 million strong, spread across 50 states. That's a million Africans per state, and nowhere in this country can I find a black community. Not in Memphis, not in Houston, not in Baltimore, not in Brooklyn, not in Boston, not in Philly, not in Detroit, not in Milwaukee, not in Little Rock, not in Chicago, not in Oakland, not in Phoenix. Nowhere in this country do we own our own school and our own bank and our own supermarket and our own hospital and our own manufacturing and distribution system. Why not? Because we comfortable being slaves. Let's just be honest. You think being in America is a privilege, although you built America. Let's be honest. Two trillion dollars is what we waste in America every year. Two trillion dollars. Thirty billion dollars on hair and weaves. Two billion dollars on Air Jordans. Twenty million dollars on children's cologne. Eight hundred million on chicken, turkey, beef and pork. Three billion on video games. And to my black parents in the building, I'm trying to understand why your son or daughter has a video game unit in their home and they can't even read on grade level. Help me understand. 
how your son and daughter got a tablet or an iPhone and they can't even count on their grade level. Help me understand. Why your son and daughter walking around with Louis Vuitton and Balenciaga and Gucci and Air Jordan and they can barely write their damn names. Help me understand how looking good is more important than doing good. Help me understand how half the black boys in America can't read on their grade level, but I don't see no state of emergency in black America. All this special education, all of these reading disabilities, all of these math disabilities, all of this ADHD, all of this conduct disorder, and for what? Your child don't have a reading disability. He has a lazy disability. Your daughter don't have a math disability. She has a I don't care to learn how to do math disability. See, in the black community, we let our children grow up thinking they're going to become multi-million dollar entertainers. And this dream of being a multi-million dollar entertainer so colonizes the mind of black youth that they quit their academic pursuits. And they do this with the full permission of their black parents. And in the black community, we do not honor the children who are academically elite. When is the last time we had a banquet to celebrate the academically elite black children? But we'll celebrate a basketball player who might not even be graduating. We'll celebrate a football player who might not even go to school anymore. Parents, I need you to understand something because you are responsible for raising the next generation of African children who are gonna fix this problem. And you need to understand that your most important job, the most important job of a black parent in these United States is to teach your child discipline. And what is Dr. Umar's definition of discipline? It's the ability to do what you don't wanna do when it has to be done, whether you like it or not. If your son don't have that, I can tell you now, there'll be a jail cell for him in a Memphis prison. If your daughter don't have that, I can tell you now, there'll be a homeless shelter for her somewhere in Memphis. If you are raising children who don't have the ability to delay gratification in order to do what they got to do, they'll never be able to do what they want to do. Brothers and sisters, I look over at that red, black, and green flag over there, the flag of the most honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey. And wherever I go, I see that red, black, and green flag. But to be honest with you, I think we have disgraced the red, black, and green flag because we haven't done anything at all to make the black community a self-sustaining institution. We ain't growing our own food on the level we should, although we got some black farmers. We ain't teaching our children how to make their own clothing. We're not teaching them how to prepare their own meals. We're raising a whole generation of black children who are spoiled and lazy. And I'm trying to understand in a country as racist as America. What good is it to spoil a child? If Malcolm X was right, and I believe El Hodge told the truth when he said if you're black, you gotta be half as good, excuse me, you gotta be twice as good to get half as much. And you raising a lazy little girl. You raising a lazy little boy. Do you not know one day you gonna leave this earth? What will your son be able to do now with you gone? My single black mothers, I love you to death, but I need some of you to do a better job with raising your sons because I'm seeing black mothers spoil their sons and raise their daughters. Train their girls and love their boys. Your son is not your husband. Your son is your child. But the problem with some homes is when there's no man in the house, the son becomes the emotional support for his mother. And just as a mother punishes a son, the son can now 
punish the mother and withhold emotional support from you. Do not let your children ever think they are your equal. Black fathers, stop trying to relive your athletic dreams through your sons. If you didn't make it into the NBA, that's your business. If you didn't make it to the NFL, that's your business. You have no right to force your son into athletics just because you're trying to get a second chance at a failed dream. Don't ruin his life trying to relive your own. And if it was up to me, there would be no NFL or NBA until black men learn how to marry black women. Because all due respect, those brothers who play in this stadium behind me, and I love them all, when they go home, they don't go home to black women. They go home to women who look anything other than black. And my black women, I'm going to hold you a little bit accountable for this because most of our sons are being raised by their mothers. So if you are raising a black boy, and when your son becomes 18 and he only wants to date white girls, I have to ask you, what were the lessons taught inside your home? No way under heaven should a black boy think it's okay to date a white woman being raised by a black woman. We gotta rethink that. We gotta rethink that. Brothers and sisters, I am a pan-Africanist. I do not teach hatred. I want the white people to get whatever God has in store for them. And I want the red people to get whatever God has in store for them. And I want the yellow people to get whatever God has in store for them. And I want the brown people to get whatever God has in store for them. But my responsibility is my own race. My responsibility is my own people. My priority is the future of African people. And I don't consider myself to be a bigot when I say that I believe God Almighty intended for black people to rule this planet. I absolutely believe that there will never be justice on the planet. There will never be righteousness on this planet. There will never be equality on earth until the black man and woman return to their throne of glory. We are the solution. Not the nuclear weapon, not Brexit, not BRICS, not the G8, not the World Bank, not the Federal Reserve, not the IMF, not the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, or the Bilderbergs. The solution to world order is African people returning to their God-given glory. That's the solution, brothers and sisters. I mean, let's look at the details now. God put us on earth all by ourselves before he evolved any other human being from our DNA. If we don't leave Africa, you never get a brown man. If we don't leave Africa, you never get a red man. If we don't leave Africa, you never get a yellow man. If you don't leave, if we don't leave Africa, you never get a white man. We're the oldest people, the genetically strongest people. And then on top of all that, God Almighty had the wisdom to put under our feet in Africa the most minerally rich piece of land in the world. You can't tell me that we were not blessed. You cannot tell me that we were not chosen. You cannot tell me that God did not intend for us to ever fall off that throne. Our job is to get back up on the throne. Black women, we can't get back up on the throne with you imitating white women beauty standards. Black men, we can't get back on the throne with you marrying outside of your race. Some of you are Christians. And if you study the Bible, you see very clearly that God told those who were chosen never to mix their seed with those who were not chosen. So if you're really a Christian, you have to be a Pan-Africanist as well because God is a Pan-Africanist. When we say Pan-Africanism, what are we saying? We're saying that all African people in the world, whether they in Zululand, whether they in Nigeria speaking Yoruba, whether they are in Kenya of the Maasai, whether they are in Puerto Rico, African Puerto Rico speaking Spanish, or whether they're in Haiti speaking French, or whether they're in Memphis speaking Ebonics, we are one race. We are one people. We are one family. 
We might be Christian, we might be Muslim, we might be Seventh-day Adventist, we might be a Jehovah's Witness, we might be a Hebrew, but we are one race, one family, one people. We may have straight hair, kinky hair, curly hair. We might have black hair or brown hair, and in some cases, a natural blonde hair, but we are one race. We may pledge this flag or pledge that flag or live under this flag, but we are one race. Our problem is we have put religion before race too long. Our problem is we have put fraternity and sorority before race too long. Our problem is we have put a loyalty to an American flag that has never been loyal to us in front of our best interests too long. The time has come, Memphis, Tennessee. The time has come, Nashville. The time has come, Chattanooga, that we have to put black people's issues first. And in order to do that, we have to stop speaking of other people's issues. When you open your mouth, you are representing black people alone. I am sick and tired of black people pulling into a conversation about black justice. The issues of brown people who never pull black issues into their conversation. You pull in issues of yellow people who never pull issues of black people into their conversation. You pull issues of red and white for what? Name me a people who have ever stood by black people. Name me a group who has ever stood by us in our fight. I am not anti-immigrant at all, but I am anti-immigrant bigotry. And many of these immigrants who come to America, not my African brothers and sisters, I'm speaking of non-African immigrants, they don't come here to stand by you. They come here to replace you. One of the reasons President Joe Biden wants to fast track 5 million immigrants to American citizenship is he wants to have more immigrants he can depend on for Democratic votes so they no longer have to cater to the issues of black folks. Brothers and sisters, the immigrants are here to replace you. I did not say disrespect them. I did not say antagonize them. I simply want you to understand, overstand, and understand that the black man has no friends. And you don't need no friends. The only people we need are one another. But until we hate racism more than we hate each other, nothing will change. We have a bad habit in the black community of only wanting to outdo black people. You never want to outdo the white power structure. You never want to outdo the European Jewish power structure. You never try to outdo the Chinese power structure. You only want to be the head nigger in charge. And that HNIC syndrome, that HNIC disease is an artifact of post-traumatic slavery disorder. And let me tell you where it comes from. See, in order to understand the HNIC crisis in the black community, why are we the only people who believe only one black person can make it at a time? Why are we the only people who believe if a black woman opens her own business, no other black woman can? If a black man succeeds in his dream, no other black man can. If your child gets a full scholarship to college, no other black child can. Where did we come up with this idea that only one Negro could make it and all other must fail? It comes from the plantation. Back on the plantations of Tennessee and back on the plantations of South Carolina and back on the plantations of Kentucky, they had manumission laws that only allow you to free a few slaves at a time. And those slaves could only be free by sabotaging and informing on other slaves. And so what happened on the plantation was we learned two things. Number one, you can only make it by sabotaging other black people. Number two, if you make it, you got to be the only one to do so. And that mindset 
that HNIC crab in a bucket mindset is still with us now 157 years after emancipation. They might have took the chains off your body, but they never took the chains off your brain. And until we achieve psychological emancipation, until we achieve intellectual emancipation, until we achieve spiritual emancipation, we will never be free. Brothers and sisters, as Pan-Africanists, we believe all black people are one people. No matter where we are in the world, we are but one. Don't focus on where the sh slave ship brought you. Focus on where the slave ship came from. Brothers and sisters, we believe that as African people, everything we must do must be done alone, by ourselves, without any non-African money, and without any non-African participation. Why? What's wrong with having a couple of liberal whites help us out? What's wrong with having a couple liberal Jews help us out? What's wrong with having a couple liberal Mexicans or Latinos help us out? What's wrong with a few benevolent Chinese lending their hand to help black people get their act together? The reason you have to refuse it is not because they may be insincere. The reason you have to refuse outside help, outside money, and outside support is because black people have to be convinced that you can win by your damn self. You got to learn how to walk alone or you will never learn how to walk at all. We have been depending on the white breasts for too long. Every time we have a problem, we look to the government to solve it. We have to make up our mind. Is the U.S. government a problem or is it our solution? Because it can't be both. It can't be both. Why is a $2 trillion people begging the government to solve its problems? It's beyond me. But I'll tell you where it comes from. It comes from the infantilism of black consciousness. It comes from a mindset of a child. Children don't think long term about their futures because their parents are responsible for doing that. Children don't pay bills. Their parents are responsible for that. Children don't think of saving their money to take care of responsibilities because it's their parents' job to do that. A child gets money and they spend it on whatever they want. That's exactly what you do in Memphis. Just like a child. You don't get your paycheck and say, let's sit down and let's buy a building and open up a laundromat and put some of these young children to work so they ain't got to rob and steal and kill. You don't think like that. When you get your paycheck after you pay your bills, you don't take your disposable income and say, who else wants to join me for a sit down on how we gonna open up Memphis's first black independent school of this decade. You don't say, how are we going to open up our own movie theater, our own shopping plaza, our own credit union, our own bank. You don't think about doing for yourself. You are comfortable letting white Tennessee dictate your life. And when they don't make decisions that are in your best interest, just like a child, you have a temper tantrum. And after you have a temper tantrum, you go right back to your dysfunctional behavior. Listen to me, Tennessee. We are different from every other race in this country on three main areas. Number one, we do not use our money to solve our problems. Black people will use their vote to solve their problems. You will use your protest to solve your problems. You will use your prayer to try to solve your problems. But we never collectively, as a community, use our money to solve our problems. How are you gonna catch up? How are you gonna build your own institutions? How are you gonna safeguard your children's future? How are you gonna create jobs to stop the crime in Memphis if you don't start using your money to finance your liberation? 
Second reason you're different, you're the only people in America who will not organize with your own race if they don't worship God the way that you do. My mother is a Christian. I have no issues with Christianity. I have a tattoo of Jesus Christ on my left shoulder. The black one, that is. Because see, in Memphis, Tennessee, we got two Jesuses. We got a black one and we got a white one. We got a Jesus Christ and we have a Jesus cracker. Some of y'all pray to Jesus Christ. Some of y'all pray to Jesus cracker. Jesus Christ was a blue, black, purple man born in a cave in Ethiopia. Jesus Cracker looks like Michael Bolton. Jesus Christ was hanged from a tree. Jesus Cracker was hung from a cross. Jesus Christ was a blue, black, purple, African kissed of the sun. Jesus Cracker is a deity that looks like your enemy. And one of the reasons black people don't get their prayers answered is because you are praying to God through the medium of your enemy's complexion. How can God answer a prayer? How can God answer a prayer when you come to God through the slave master? How can you get your prayers answered? Some of you right here right now got a white Jesus in your house. Don't lie. You won't get rid of it because you say it's been in your family for eight generations. Grandma gave it to you from the plantation. Well, you tell grandma we're going to have a ritualistic assassination of this picture. When you go home tonight, take every white image in your house and burn it. Not because you hate white people, but in order to restore self-respect to African people, you cannot worship the enemies of another race. And don't put it in the trash. Because if you put a picture of Jesus Christ in the trash in Tennessee, another Negro will come along, take it out the trash, and put it back on their wall. You got to burn it. That's how much we in love with blue eyes. That's how much we in love with green eyes. That's how much we in love with pale skin. I just learned the other day, black people spend over $10 billion on skin bleaching creams every year across the world. Trying to rob yourself of your melanin because you don't understand the universal significance of your melanin. This is not color, this is power, this is energy, this is your birthright. You don't kill your complexion for your enemy. But we still got grandmothers in Tennessee when the grandbaby come home from the hospital. Y'all still looking behind their ear to see how dark they gonna get. We still got aunties and uncles in Tennessee when they want to spend some time with their niece and nephew, you still go into the lightest child. Or we have the opposite situation, where you have a dark skin auntie, uncle, blue, black, purple, beautiful grandmother or grandfather who been so ridiculed over their skin color that they reject the lighter skin children in the family. So we got light skin supremacy and dark skin supremacy, and both of them are the children of white supremacy. Get rid of the isms. We don't have no time for isms. America is trying to bury the black man and woman. They're trying to do it locally and they're trying to do it globally. You got to teach your child who they are. Imitation is death. And why would the oldest people in the world imitate the youngest people in the world? It makes absolutely no sense at all. We got five major problems that gotta be solved in order for us to get back up on the throne. And by the way, nobody's getting on the throne with a white wife. Nobody's getting on the throne with a red wife. Nobody's getting on the throne with a yellow wife. Nobody's getting on the throne with a brown wife. All respect to those people. But black men, we have disgraced our race by constantly looking for the hand of another man's daughter to build family with. If the black woman ain't good enough for you, you ain't good enough to be in our community no more. Pack your bags and get the hell on out. You tell me you don't see color. Love don't know no color. Well, if love don't know no color, why is it we can't find any broke black men married to rich white women if love don't know no color? 
See, women, on average, will outlive men. We're physically superior, but they're biologically superior. And when you die, Kobe Bryant, when you die, Marvis Marvelin Hagler, and you leave a large estate to a non-black woman, you have just robbed your community of necessary resources. All due respect to Vanessa Bryant, but she ain't thinking about thinking about using any of Kobe Bryant's black money to help the black community. Stop robbing us to give to a people who have already taken too much. I ain't got no issue with the snow bunny. I got an issue with the snow bunny taking my damn money out of my community. We got to fight miseducation. I want every parent in here to listen up. When I come back to Tennessee, I want to have a meeting to organize statewide the Tennessee National Independent Black Parents Association to fight for justice in the schools until we have our own. There's going to be seven committees of the Tennessee National Independent Black Parent Association. Committee number one, special education. I need all y'all to hear me well who have children in special ed. I want you to hear me very well. I want to quote some federal law that I know you don't know, because if you knew it, you wouldn't be putting your children in special ed as quickly as you all. Number one, a child can only qualify for special education services in the United States of America if they have two things. I'm giving you the law. And I'll probably have to come back to Tennessee and do my black parent boot camp training. But let me give you this. Your child must have a disability, and the disability must affect learning in the regular class. Let me say this again. Your child must have a disability. That's the easy part, because white folks will give you any label you're looking for, right? But just because you have a disability, you do not qualify for special ed. Let me say that again. Just because you're autistic, doesn't mean you go to special ed. Just because you got a hearing impairment doesn't mean you go to special ed. Just because you have ADHD, ain't no daddy at home disorder, don't mean you go to special ed. You only go to special ed if the disability affects learning. So can I ask you a question? Why do we have black children right here in Memphis in a special ed classroom all day long and they can learn just fine in the regular classroom. Your child's school is breaking the law. Your child's school is intruding on your rights. Let me give you another law. Federal law says, even if the child qualifies for special education, they cannot be in the special ed classroom any longer than what is absolutely necessary in order for them to learn. So let me give you an example. Your son has a so-called reading disability. It ain't nothing but a lazy disability, but for the sake of conversation, we'll continue. Because he don't want to read, and you don't want to make him. You lazy, and he is too. Let's just be honest. You don't make your children read. You don't take them to the public library. You ain't never took them to a black bookstore. There's no quiet hour. There's no study hour. There's no meditation hour in your house. That means that is not a home. That is a plantation for the slave master. Your house is a plantation for the slave master where you raise slaves that can go to his prison plantation. So your son has a reading disability. And he should only be in special ed for what class? Reading. So why is your special ed son in special ed for reading, math, science, history, art, gym, bathroom, lunch, class trip. He don't ever come the hell out of the class. Do you know what that's called? That's called a federal violation of free and appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment. If your child is spending too much time in special ed, you have a lawsuit on your hands. And guess what else? 
If they evaluate your child and you don't agree with the evaluation, you have a right to a second opinion. It's called an independent educational evaluation. You find your own psychologist. You find your own psychologist and the school district must pay for that evaluation. You must first write a letter to the principal. Dear Principal, principal Adolf Hitler, of the We Hate Black Children Middle School in Memphis, Tennessee. My son Raekwon was evaluated by your psychologist, classified with a reading disability. I do not agree that my son has a reading disability. The reason he's in the fifth grade, reading on the second grade level, is because last year, in the fourth grade, he was suspended from school so often he wasn't allowed to learn. In the third grade, his teacher went on maternity leave and he had about 20 substitutes from November to June. When my son was in the first grade, he had a brand new teacher right out of We Hate Black Children, Tennessee University, who could barely read herself. I don't believe he has a reading disability. I believe he ain't been taught. I'm requesting my federal right to an independent educational evaluation at school district expense. Once you approve my request, I will provide you with the name of the psychologist I've chosen to conduct the independent evaluation. I'm giving you the laws. But you know what I notice? Black parents get taken advantage of more than all the other parents because you believe what the school says more than all other parents. They can tell you anything. John John is retarded. Okay. Shanae emotionally disturbed. Okay. Mike Mike got a math disability. Okay. You don't ask no questions. You don't challenge nothing they say. See? When I evaluate your child, I bring them into my office. I give them an IQ test, reading test, math test, writing test, visual motor test, adaptive behavior test, emotional test, psychological assessment. I observe them in the classroom. I interview their parents. I interview the teacher. I look at past test scores, past report cards, past incident reports. And we look at all these tests. And from that, we make a professional determination based on the preponderance of evidence as to whether or not we believe because we don't know whether we believe he has a learning disability what are you saying dr umar i'm saying the learning disability is not a scientific fact you cannot prove a reading disability it is an opinion you cannot prove a math disability. It is an opinion. You cannot prove ADHD, conduct disorder, emotional disturbance. It is an opinion. And my problem with black parents is you keep on taking your sons down to the clinic to get a white person's opinion on whether they have ADHD. You want a white person's opinion on whether they have a reading disability. You want a white person's opinion on whether they have a math disability. Can I ask you a question? Why is the white man's opinion worth any more than your own? Ain't no need for all this testing. Y'all think labeling your child is a solution. Don't you know they're going to struggle even more after they go in special ed? Because how can you catch up going slower than everybody else? And what a lot of you don't know is when you try to pull them out and put them in a private school, the private school can reject your child because in America, private schools do not have to accept children with IEPs. And then when I look for the mentally gifted black children in Memphis, I can't find the mentally gifted black children. Why we got so few mentally gifted black children? Because white folks don't think our children can be cognitively superior. I've heard them say it. I've heard black, white psychologists say it. I will never diagnose one of those children as mentally gifted. So you mean to tell me we got all the problems and none of the abilities. And you know what make it worse? Many of your children are being taught by unlicensed, uncertified, uncredentialed, long-term substitutes. So you mean to tell me 
You want me to put my child in special ed for reading when you don't even know how to teach them how to read? You want me to put my child in special ed for math and you can't even teach them how to count? And y'all go to these meetings. Y'all don't ask no questions. See, when I go to the meetings, I would say something like, um, my son is in the fifth grade reading on the third grade level. How many other children in his class is reading on that same third grade level? And if the other kids in the class are two grades behind, just like my son, isn't this a teaching problem and not an IEP problem? And when the school tells you he don't know how to act, you got to come pick him up. Oh, no, 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 I'm not picking him up. It's your job to educate my son. And if your son does have so-called ADHD, which I don't support, but if he got the label, let's use it to help him. If your son got an ADHD label and the school is calling you to come pick him up, you tell them it's time for a 504 accommodation plan. And you go to the school for a 504 accommodation plan meeting, and now they have to pay to give your son a one-on-one -on -one aid to follow him around so they can stop calling you up. That's the law. That's the law. Parents, stop signing paperwork you don't understand at the school. Stop going to school meetings by yourself. And black women, stop telling your personal business to your children's teacher. Your child's teacher is not your friend. She's not your life coach. She's not your social worker. She's not your pastor. She is a correctional officer in the Memphis Public School to Prison Department. That's what she is. That's what she is. That's what she is. Y'all go in there. Oh, yeah, my son's father locked up. I'm living in my mama basement. I was a victim of domestic violence. I'm a recovering addict. Nothing to be ashamed of. But if you tell that to them, they will use it later to force you to put your son on medication. And if you don't, Child Services of Tennessee will take your children away from you. If you don't plan to medicate, why were they evaluated? If you don't plan to medicate, why were they evaluated? If you're not going to give them crack for kids, why in the hell did they get an ADHD evaluation in the first place? The only solution in America for black boys with ADHD, conduct disorder, ODD, and emotional disturbance is Concerta, Ritalin, Adderall, Cyclert, Metadate. In other words, crack, 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 and synthesize crack. As I prepare to wrap up, Brothers and sisters, we got some difficult days ahead. Dr. King said it 55 years ago tonight. I'm saying it now. I don't think Dr. King could envision us going through what we go through right now. I don't think Dr. King knew that we would have a situation where black children in the kindergarten and first grade are being given a right to decide if they want to change their gender. I don't think he knew about that. I don't think Dr. King envisioned a situation where the first black president in America, Barack Obama, would penetrate the public schools with a unnatural narrative of family creation. I don't think Dr. King envisioned a situation where we would have 50 years of hip hop music, most of which would be dominated by misogyny, black on black crime, law breaking, and conspicuous consumption, and all the billions of dollars made out of hip hop music, damn near none of it has come to the black community. I don't think Dr. King envisioned that. I don't think Dr. King knew that once we got a chance to go to these predominantly white institutions, that after we graduate, most of us would turn our nose up at other black people. See, let me explain something to you, Memphis. I don't have to live here, but I do know one thing for certain and two things for sure. You cannot control a city as black as Memphis is. You can't control a city as hardcore as Memphis is. You can't control a city as large as black Memphis is without an effective black bourgeoisie.
Without the black bourgeoisie, there would be no oppression. Who are the five families of the Memphis black bourgeoisie? One family are your elected officials. Not all of them. There are exceptions to the rule. We have a few of those exceptions with us tonight. But most of your elected black politicians are financed to go in office to distract you while white folks is robbing your resources out of the city. I'm going to say that again. White people will run black people for office because they know you so politically uneducated, you think a black face automatically means better days. And so why are you so intoxicated with the image of an HNIC in City Hall or state legislature or at the state governmental level? White folks is robbing you blind. White folks get more contracts under black leaders than they get under white leaders. You can't control black people without sellout black politicians. Which is why I don't vote for black folks no more unless they independent candidates. I will never cast another ballot for a Democrat. I will never cast another ballot for a Republican. If you're not independent, you ain't got an independent mind. You ain't got an independent idea. You don't think independently. And you damn sure ain't got no independent money to help black Memphis out. So if you're still a slave of the Democratic Party plantation, go and get you some flip-flops and some slave dungarees and leave me the hell alone until you wake up and become free. The next family is black people in your media, black radio, black TV, black newspaper, black website. They black journals. They do not cover the important stories in Memphis. They always talk about who got shot at the mini market last night. Who won the lottery last week? Who the Memphis Grizzlies is going to get on the offseason? How much John Moran scored in the last game. But they not telling you who gentrifying Memphis. They not telling you what black pastors is working with the enemy. They not telling you who ripping off and miseducating your children. It is a black journalism to miseducate you so white folks continue to rob you. And who the third family of the black bourgeoisie in Memphis, Tennessee? This would be your academic elite. Some of them work at Tennessee State. Some of them work at the University of Tennessee. Some of them work at Lamone Owen College or up there at uh, Fisk University. They in the PWIs, in the HBCUs. And whenever somebody asks them, why black people in Memphis can't get it together? Why black children in Memphis ain't graduating on time? Why we got so many homeless people in black Memphis? You know what they do? They blame you. Black people are lazy, black people are undisciplined, black people don't know how to save their money, but they never talk about white folks and the rule that they play. See, you can't never say black people are the reason for our problems because we don't control none of them. You can't blame us for the schools, we don't control the schools, white people do. You can't blame me for police brutality. Yeah, you might have a black chief, but she's not in charge. You might have a black superintendent, he's not in charge. Don't confuse the face with the power that controls the space. I don't control the economy. How are you gonna blame me for black unemployment? I don't control the prisons or the judicial system. How are you gonna blame me for mass incarceration? So you got your academic Negroes, your elected Negroes, your media Negroes, and then you got your black economic elite. These are black millionaires in Memphis. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Brothers and sisters on their way to being millionaires. When Joe Biden run for office, they got a nice check for his campaign. When Barack Obama came through, they had a nice check for his campaign, but you trying to run a summer camp for children. They ain't got a damn dollar for you. You trying to clean up the neighborhood. They ain't got a damn dollar for you. You trying to help single mothers. 
they ain't got a damn dollar for you. But whenever United Way needs some money, they can get a check. But whenever these black women out here taking care of our kids need some money, they don't even see you. And who's the last of the five families? You got economic bourgeois, academic bourgeois, elected official bourgeois, media bourgeois. But the list would not be complete without your religious bourgeois. Yes. I'm going to talk about Reverend Porkchop. I'm going to talk about Deacon Watermelon. I'm going to talk about Deaconess Turkey Wings. I'm going to talk about Pastor Kool-Aid. Oh, yes. Convincing black people that God want you to be poor. Convincing black people that God want you to be poor so they don't have to fight for any resources on your behalf. And you got black people running around Memphis thinking God is blessing you because you broke. The pastor got you thinking having nothing makes you a child of God. You must worship a God of powerlessness. I don't worship a God of powerlessness. I worship a God of power and empowerment. And the God I worship is a God who don't want me to be broke. My God don't want single black mothers in the street begging for meals. My God don't want black boys in juvenile detention. My God don't want black mothers being locked up and their children being scattered off to white foster homes where they get sexually trafficked. That ain't what my God wants. My God want black people to be in a position of authority. My God want the needs of all black people taken care of. My God want black people to stand up and confront white people and look them in their blue eyes and tell them we have had enough. That's what my God wants. My God is not a God of cowards. My God is not a God of docility. My God is a God of justice. And my God tells me that you will get that justice even if you got to die for that justice. That's the God that I serve. But because the pastor, not all of them, but most, because the pastor is a coward, he has to give you the image of God who is also a coward. As I wrap up, take out your phone because I want to give you my personal cell number in case you got to reach me about your children. After the day, I don't ever to hear nothing about Memphis, Tennessee. Dr. Umar, they said my son was autistic. I don't know what to do. First of all, if, he, if they say he's autistic and he's not at least five years old, do not get him or her evaluated. Listen to me. I'm an autism expert. You cannot prove autism at two years old. You cannot prove autism at three years old. Why do they want you to get your child tested for autism at two and three and four? You know why? They want the money that comes from the state for giving your child the autistic services. In fact, I don't want no black child in Tennessee evaluated for anything under the second grade. Unless they're blind, unless they're deaf, unless they have an orthopedic impairment, a brain injury, a medical condition, unless they have one of those. Don't you ever let your child get tested for reading and math disabilities in kindergarten and first grade. How the hell you got a reading problem and they just start teaching you how to read last week? Special education is where they send black boys they don't want to be bothered with until he's old enough to drop out or go to jail. My cell number is 215-989-9858. 215-989-9858. Once more for my special ed parents. I'm picking with you because you wasn't special ed either. I had a black mother tell me to my face at a meeting one time at the school. She said, Dr. Umar, you don't know what you're talking about. 
My son has a reading disability, and I know he does because his daddy had a reading disability. I had a reading disability. My mama had a reading disability. His grandfather had a reading disability. She said, reading disabilities run in my family. And I said, sister, special education is only 49 years old. It is not genetically inherited. I said, but let me tell you what runs in your family. Lazy ass parents running your family. No homework running your family. No bedtime running your family. No reading running your family. That's what's running in your damn family. Underachievement and low expectations. Get your ass up out of my office. Brothers and sisters, back home in Wilmington, Delaware. I live in Philadelphia, but Wilmington is 30 minutes from the front door. We have a Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy. Many of you helped us raise money these past nine years to open this school. And I'm here to tell you that the school is just about done. We will be having a black community grand opening sometime this summer. And for all of you who have donated, and I hope you continue to donate because although the Marcus Garvey Elementary School has done renovations, we now have to go across the street to the Frederick Douglass High School. We got two modern school buildings, all black, all black money. We control it. It is an independent school where we teach children how to think independently. We will teach them agricultural and agronomical science. We will teach them dietary and nutritional science. We will teach them military and political science. We will teach them economic and financial science. We will teach them the science of African spirituality and ancestral veneration. And we will teach them the science of the black man, woman, and child. If any of you would like to work at FDMG, please send me your resume. Don't worry about being a certified teacher. Independent schools have a separate process for becoming certified. All right, all right. We need math teachers. We need science teachers. We need reading teachers. We need language teachers. We need people who can teach our children how to speak African languages. We need black women who can teach our girls natural hair care. We need black men who can teach our boys gun and rifle training, hunting and fishing, and living off of the land. We want to create the new black print for how children should be educated going forward. And I'm hoping that one day we get our hands on a school right here in Memphis, Tennessee, so we can build the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy of Memphis, Tennessee. I said the Ida B. Wells campus, the Dr. Martin Luther King campus. You know what bothers me the most about our politicians? Everywhere I go around the country, I always ask the politicians to do me one favor. Get me one of these empty schools that's just sitting around. I don't need no money from you. I don't want no subsidy. I am a pan-Africanist. It is against my beliefs to take money from white folks. Just give me the building. I've been saying this for 10 years, and I ain't had a black politician deliver Dr. Umar a school building yet. What good are you if you can't bring resources back to your own people? I see Mexicans getting buildings. I see white people getting free buildings. I see all kind of people getting buildings, but we can't get one. Brothers and sisters, I want to leave you with a quote from my ancestor, Frederick Douglass. And when I'm done, anybody who want to have a word with me, take a photo with me, we can do that. I do have some copies of my books out here. Where's Sister Tanisha at? Over there with the uh, Ethiopian banner. If you want to get a copy of my book, you can purchase it with Cash App, Apple Pay, Zelle, PayPal, Cash, Credit Card. Check as well, as long as the check is yours. My family was brought to America in 1701. A black man named Bailey, stolen from Nigeria. He was brought to Talbot County, Eastern Shore, Maryland. He married a black woman by the name of Selah, for whom my 11-year-old daughter is named. 1745, they had Grandma Jenny. 1774, Grandma Jenny gave birth to Grandma Betsy. My Grandma Betsy was born into slavery, but she married a free black man, Grandpa Isaac. Together, they had 12 children. One daughter was named Harriet, and another daughter was named Young Betsy, my five times great-grandmother. 
These two enslaved African women were raped by the slave master who owned our family. And as a result of that rape, in 1818, Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey was born. And in 1819, his first cousin and half-brother, my five times great-grandfather, Stephen Henry Bailey, was born. Frederick and Stephen were cousins because their mothers were sisters. But they were also brothers because the slave master raped those sisters. When the Civil War started in 1861, Cousin Fred sent two sons, Lewis and Charles. They went north to Boston and they fought in the U.S. Colored Troops, excuse me, the Massachusetts 54th Colored Regiment. Also in the 54th Colored Regiment was the son of Martin Delaney, first black man to be admitted into Harvard Medical School, one of our earliest black newspaper publishers, co-author of the North Star with Frederick Douglass, and the first uniformed officer in the Civil War. Sojourner Truth first black woman to win a case in court against a white man during slavery her son was also or grandson rather was in the 54th Massachusetts my grandfather Stephen married grandma Caroline they had grandpa George on November 14th 1841 grandpa George fought in the 9th regiment US colored troops of Maryland grandpa Stephen fought in the 19th regiment US colored troops of Maryland that means they were present at Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia when Confederate General Robert E. Lee surrendered the Confederacy to General Ulysses S. Grant, my grandfathers were there. Why is that important? Because they tell us Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves. Abraham Lincoln didn't free the slaves. The slaves freed Abraham Lincoln, brothers and sisters. My grandfather George was also in Galveston, Texas on June 19th, 1865 when General Gordon Granger read special order number three giving emancipation to all Africans in Texas previously held in bondage, which became the Juneteenth holiday, my grandfather was there. When the Civil War was over, Grandpa George married Grandma Manny, they had Grandma Caroline, she moved to Philadelphia, she had Grandma Vivian, Grandma Vivian married Grandpa Cicero from Cuba, they had Grandma Ida who passed to the ancestors five years ago, she met and married James Johnson who passed to the ancestors a few years before her, they had my father Jamal, he married Barbara, and on August the 21st in the ghettos of North Philadelphia, the Nat Turner anniversary, the Haitian Revolution anniversary, the George Jackson prison anniversary, the original birthday of Jesus the Christ, August the 21st. I was born in North Philly. Right. Frederick Douglass said, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess the faith of freedom but deprecate agitation are like men who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want the rain but can't stand the thunder or the lightning. Memphis, Tennessee, they want the ocean but they're scared of the roar of the water. Frederick Douglass said, a man may not get all you pay for, but you will pay for everything that you get. And if Memphis, Tennessee is ever to become free of the oppression inflicted upon you, you must pay for its removal. You may pay with money, you may pay through war, you may pay with your life, but there will be no freedom unless you pay for it. Frederick Douglass said, for 20 years, I prayed to God for freedom for 20 years. But the good Lord above gave me no freedom until I got up off my knees and prayed with my feet. He said, if you want respect from white people, why do you look for pity? The man who pities you will never respect you, and the man who respects you has no need to pity you. Power can seize nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. I want to leave you with a story about an ancestor by the name of Araminta Ross. Some of you know her as Harriet Tubman. This black woman escaped from slavery to freedom in 1850 through Wilmington, Delaware, where the school is, up to Philadelphia, where I live. When Harriet Tubman got free, less than five feet, less than 120 pounds soaking wet, she decided to go back to get all of her family members. So she snuck back alone, freeing everybody but one because they were already sold. When she got her parents to safety, Harriet Tubman said, I got to go back, mama. I got to go back, papa. They said, Harriet, don't go back. Your slave master has a $40,000 bounty on your head. Sit this out. Harriet Tubman looked at her mother and father. She said, mama and papa, it's not up to you. God gave me this mission. And I will not abandon the orders of the Lord. 
And if I get caught, I will not offer a single cry of mercy. I will take that as a message from my God that he no longer needs my service. And I will go on back to heaven. Harriet Tubman said, there was plenty of times I almost got caught. Plenty of times when I got cornered on the Underground Railroad. But whenever I ran into a jam, I would drop to my hands and knees and beg the Lord to give me a way up out of that situation. And whenever I asked my father in heaven for a way out, he delivered me. Right. Queen Mother Harriet said, all my journeys on the Underground Railroad, I never lost a passenger, never ran my road off, never ran my train off the track. But I always took a gun with me because there would always be some ninja somewhere who would get too scared to keep on going. And whenever I ran into one of these scared, shaken, terrified slaves, I would cock my gun to his head and say, you will go on or you will die here because dead niggas tell no tales. And those were her words. She said, I freed hundreds of slaves. I could have freed thousands more. But the problem was, they didn't even know that they were slaves. After the Underground Railroad, Queen Mother Harriet was called to join the Union cause. She became a nurse, a spy, a scout in the Civil War, never being paid. She earned her living by washing clothing and tending to the diseases of the sick soldiers of the Union Army. She applied for a soldier's pension. They turned it down. When she got back up to Auburn, New York, this so-called illiterate black woman opened up an old folks home for black people. Because you know in slavery, they would turn you out to die on the street. Harriet Tubman built a home. This woman ain't have no college degree. She didn't even have a GED. But she built a home. And then after Harriet Tubman built a home for ex-slaves, she then built a hospital for ex-slaves. And then after she built the hospital, she built a farm to pay for the hospital and the home. And here you is in Memphis, Tennessee, with all this disposable income, and you can't find a way to solve your problems. God is angry at black America because black America doesn't believe in black America. Queen Mother Harriet Tubman is the only woman in American history to lead soldiers into battle. She did so. The Kambahi River Raid, she took U.S. colored troops down the Kambahi River, and in one day, she freed over 750 slaves in an instant. Right. Brothers and sisters, our work is obvious. That's right. The road will be tough, but three things we need, and we will get back to where Dr. King wanted us to go. Number one, we need unity. Number two, we need self-love. And number three, we need an economic sacrificial spirit that guarantees us victory. It's not up to God. It's not up to the government. We decide when we become free. Memphis, Tennessee, I love you. Black power. <laughs> Memphis, show some love. Dr. Umar Johnson, he's going to hang around to take pictures to talk with you, and he's going to be ready. Black power! Listen, everybody, as we get ready, listen, just real quickly, just stand where you are just one second. Touch the shoulder of somebody else. We're just going to say this word of affirmation, and we're going to get out of here.